You've all heard of the Flying Nun, but well, we've gone one better. We found the Flying Padre. He's over here in Western Australia in this northeast corner, and he has the largest parish in the world. To find out more about it, we're going to fly with the Reverend Catford. Then we're going to look at some more of our unique wildlife. In fact, this one's a prickly customer, the echidna, or more commonly known as the spiny anteater. Millions of years ago, Australia was covered with snow and ice during the last great ice age. Now, some of that ice compacted and formed into glaciers, particularly in Tasmania. Now, there's no more glaciers here, of course, they've all melted. What we're going to do is take a look at the glaciers which do exist in the South Island of New Zealand. And we're going to see them in two aspects. One, in close-up on the glacier itself, and secondly, from the fantastic vantage point of a helicopter flying over the top of the frozen mountains of South Island of New Zealand. Western Australia is the biggest state in Australia, so it's not unusual to find some of the biggest things over here. I'm not talking about the church behind me, but the parish that's administered by the Reverend Don Catford. He has a novel way of meeting his parishioners, which we found out from Rick Stroud in Tom Price, who wrote, I would like to see our local minister, Don Catford, shown doing his rounds. He is one of the few flying padres in the country, and he covers the huge mining areas of the Hammersleys. Well, we're here to meet Don Catford now. But it's been a fair bit the Reverend Don around. Catford, who prefers to be called Don, invited me to go along on one of his regular flights. He spends most of his time away from his Tom Price home, visiting people in isolated areas. We have to go on to the um, Hammersley Exploration Camp. That's uh, about another 25 miles further on. There's about 20 chaps out there, and uh, they're proving reserves of ore for another mine sometime in the future, about five or six years hence, I'd imagine. Just check the oil here. Anything I don't like flying, it's aeroplanes that haven't got enough oil and petrol in them. Yeah, that's all right. Before you went in planes, you used to go by uh, four-wheel drive, I imagine. Uh, I used to go in cars, but the problem was that this, you know, the roads are always wet, and all the stations around this country, Mike, have got their own strips. The uh, dirt strips so play havoc with these props. There's a few little nicks in here, but this, uh, they'll, they'll be all right. They'll get us there. Um, also, on the way out to uh, Hammersley Station, we'll probably fly along the line and see if we can't see a, a train or two. And uh, then um, we'll go past the 252 kilometre railway camp where the chaps who work on the line live. Uh, I go out there occasionally, but that strip is probably a bit wet as well. Yes, that's all right. And just this one on the end and we're away. There's any fuel in it? Uh, yes. There's enough fuel you can carry in this to fly from here to Alice Springs. I'm going to a conference in Alice Springs at the beginning of May, so uh, it's pretty barren between here and there, I'd say. That's about oh, it. Are we ready to go? Yep. Don and his family moved to Tom Price three years ago, and it wasn't long before he realised the need to have an aircraft to get around such a large territory. He admits learning to fly didn't come easy to him, but he has now clocked up over 500 flying hours and averages about 200 hours per year. Heavy rain overnight may mean that some of the airstrips will be too wet to land on, but Don holds hopes that the exploration camp strip will be dry because it's on higher ground than the station strips in this area. Don says the station people like to see him because he hasn't come for anything. Most people who call, like the flying doctor or travelling salesman, have come to do or sell something. Don just comes to have a talk or listen, and maybe give some advice if they ask for it.
The airstrip at Hammersley Station is too wet to land on, so we head south about 50 kilometres to an exploration campsite called Namaldi. The strip looks dry enough, so Don buzzes the camp before landing. John Evans, the camp manager, takes us out to the drilling rig site where the men are collecting core samples to be analysed for iron ore content. There are quite a number of these exploration sites around the Pilbara country where men are isolated for weeks and sometimes months at a time. The mining companies provide air conditioned facilities for the men and even a bar and swimming pool here, but still a new face to talk to is often a welcome sight. John Evans explains the operation of the diamond head drill to Dawn. Dollars worth in the core tray there. Uh, expensive business, isn't it? Uh, yeah. That's worth 500 bills. It's, um, there's probably about 30 carats of diamond there, and we might get 10 or 11 back that are usable plus scrap, and the rest we just sort of wipe off. In an area like this, the turnover of men is pretty high, so Don is always meeting people and making new friends. Don is a practical man who understands people. He rarely preaches in the strict sense of the word. Rather, he listens and counsels and helps if needed. Yeah, how long have you been out from Ireland? Six years. Have you? Haven't lost your accent yet. I don't want to either. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. How long have you been working on the diamond drills? Since I came here, six years. Have you? Yeah. Well, you've done a bit of work on them back, at back home. home yeah. I've done a bit at home for ten months. Yeah. I'm out here. And how long have you been at the Maldives? Two weeks, three weeks. I was here last year, though, for ah, yeah. two and a half months. What, and you go and went home to spend a bit of the... Yeah. Time. That's good. Yeah. And uh, where were you born? I'm yeah. in Perth, but I've, uh, parents have had a station up here the last few, or up until about three years ago. Oh, what station's that? Royal Hill. Oh, yes. See, I get out that way occasionally. We leave the exploration camp and head back to Tom Price. Now Don has met the new men at Namaldi, he'll be dropping in again next time he takes to the sky to cover his parish in the northwest. Don, how big's your parish? Um, it extends for about 400 miles east and west by 150 miles north and south, about 50,000 square miles, I guess. It's got um, 30 pastoral stations three exploration camps where people are drilling and testing for iron ore, plus a number of uh, small uh, exploration people, and a couple of line camps, about 10,000 people altogether in the area, but spread over uh, this tremendous, uh, tremendously big land, I guess. Um, I would say about 1,600 of those people are single men. So there's plenty of people around the area who uh, always glad to see me and talk to somebody who's not their foreman or their boss. They feel more free with you? Oh, I, I'd like to think they do. Uh, I don't uh, work for anybody with whom they're associated and uh, they just find it refreshing, I guess, to talk to somebody different uh, who's seen a bit of the world, who comes from another state, perhaps from the same state that they've come from. And you talk but, their language too, don't you? Sort of more down to earth uh, than anybody I've met in the ministry? Well, uh, that's your comment, Mike. It's not mine. Uh, I suppose I uh, can tell a few stories like the rest of the people <laughs> around the place, but uh, I've got uh, one pretty good story to tell too. And Flying Padre, the Reverend Don Catford, will continue to tell his story to the isolated people in the Pilbara. We have had many letters asking to see various Australian animals. Mark Pelsers of Leopold in Victoria is just one of the many people who have written to say they would like to know more about an echidna and its way of life. 
Although it is a naturally shy animal, it is not difficult to see an echidna in the wild. They may be found any time during the day, wandering about in bushland or open country. They're often seen on country roads. They move slowly at about one kilometre an hour. The echidna is often known as a spiny anteater, and its diet consists of ants and termites, which it gathers with its long sticky tongue. It will dig deep into ants' nests or climb logs and stumps to reach a nest. When you come across an echidna in the bush, it's very hard to actually see what they're like except for their spines on their back, because their defence mechanism is to dig into the ground so all their spines are showing. They don't have any teeth and they won't bite you, but it's very difficult to pick them up without getting the spikes in your fingers. So he's starting to dig in now because he can see that I'm here. See that? Just touch him and he digs all those in and puts the spines upwards. A very good defence against predators, even man who's pretty strong, hangs on with his little claws. Very strong. Come on, up we come. You see how he's hooked his feet in? There. That's it. Oh. If left to dig long enough, he can get such a strong hold that to try to dislodge him would cause internal injuries. What is it? It's a kidna. A kidna. A kidna. Uh, there's a little one. Just a little one. Yeah. yeah. See? Don't touch him. Got berries on him. Quite furry underneath. So they immediately try and curl up as soon as you pick them up or as soon as you even touch them. If you're very careful, you can hold them in your hand without getting the spikes in your fingers. The echidna is a monotreme, an egg-laying mammal which suckles its young. The female develops a pouch only in the breeding season. They normally lay only one egg, which is incubated in the pouch for about ten days. It has no nipples, and the young suckle milk from two special areas of the skin inside the pouch. As the young echidna develops, it is left in a rotten log, hollow stump or a burrow covered with leaves. It remains hidden all day. The mother feeds during the day and returns to suckle the young and rest at night. Look, Sandy, look what daddy's got. Look. Where? He looks like he made him too. I know, Barker. Look underneath him. Yeah. Look. What do you think about it? <laughs> you are trying to put him down, you run along the ground. <laughs> At the head of this huge U-shaped valley on the South Island of New Zealand is one of the best known glaciers in the world, the Franz Josef Glacier, named in honour of the Emperor of Austria by explorer Julius von Haast in 1865. We've come here to have a look at the glacier because of a letter from Miss Karen Noon in Bondi Beach in Sydney who says that uh, she'd like to ask the Lannan brothers if we'd like to walk on a glacier. She had the opportunity to do this when she was at Franz Josef. It was a fantastic experience. So I'd just drop you a line and ask you to travel to Franz Josef in New Zealand and try your hand at it. Well, Miss Noon, we've never tried our hand at glacier climbing at all because we don't have any in Australia. But uh, we're going to give it a go, as you suggest. Just before we do, we're going to talk with Peter McCormack, the TED guide here at Trans Peter, can you um, tell Miss Noon a few things about the glacier itself, like how fast does it flow? Or well, something? This is a pretty interesting thing, this glacier. Of course, there's no glaciers in Australia, as you just mentioned, but there are signs where glaciers were, where the rock has been rubbed and smoothed in Tasmania, I mean, South Australia, and perhaps other places too. There's been glaciers, but we are lucky in New Zealand. We've still got about 300 named glaciers, but we've got the Fox and Franz Josef, that you see here are terminating only a thousand feet above sea level and a very fast flowing glacier too. To bring it down to such a low level, of course, it has to flow fast. Well, Peter, this climb that Miss Noon talks about, do many people do that? Well, we take about 15 or 16,000 people up there a year onto the glacier. Uh, people can see it from here and people walk up to the edge of it, but we take people about a thousand feet up the glacier. To reach the terminal face of the glacier, where the packed ice melts, it's necessary to walk through the boulder-strewn valley for several kilometres, climbing all the time. The massive weight of 14 kilometres of solid ice continually grinding through the valley 
erodes the valley floor and walls deeper into solid rock. The ground up fragments of rock form an enormous pile of stony rubble known as moraine. This huge pile of moraine presents the walkers with climbing that can sometimes be a little frightening, especially to those that have never tackled bushwalking before. And it's made worse today by a howling dicey wind, which our guide assures us is very rare. Emerging from the glacier terminal face, an enormous volume of water is coloured with stone sediment from the massive erosion taking place under the ice. This water is so heavily laden with rock flour that the water is often called glacier milk. Peter McCormack's ice pick is not just a symbol of rank. Once on the glacier, he cuts steps into the glass smooth ice, thus roughening up the surface and providing good grip for the steel studded shoes. Treacherous melt holes several metres in diameter are everywhere on the glacier, making it even more vital to stay on the track carved by the guide. As we climb higher, the ever-changing shapes of the blue glacier display wind-sculptured surfaces of remarkable beauty. Peter McCormack's practice hand chips the ice steps as he has done for 25 years, bringing another group of amazed visitors to the surface of Franz Joseph Glacier. In all that time, he says every trip is different. The changing ice shapes continually provide a new view. And Peter loves talking to people about what he may justifiably call his glacier. The beauty of such a massive body of clean ice is an enormous reward for the climb, which is quite safe as long as it is made with an experienced guide. Wind holes in the ice and melting crevices are everywhere. This is one of the rare parts of the world where glaciers come so far down from the feeding snowfields that the valley is bounded by rainforest covered walls. The steepness of flow of Franz Joseph Glacier, about ten times steeper than those found in other parts of the world, make this one of the fastest flowing glaciers on record, in the steeper spots up to five metres a day. A continually melting, beautiful, frozen world, a river of ice. To get a better idea of just how big these glaciers are, we take to the air only 25 kilometres from Franz Joseph Glacier to have a bird's eye view of the even longer Fox Glacier. Our pilot operates a sightseeing service for visitors who wish to fly along the length of this most impressive river of ice. The Fox Glacier is 16 kilometres in length and to reach the top, the pilot must climb to an altitude of 2,600 metres.
clouds at 3,762 metres. We can also see part of the huge snow fields that permanently cover these higher mountains and feed the Franz Josef and Fox glaciers. Glaciers are fed by snow, which under great pressure forms into clear ice. The air trapped between the crystals of snow is forced out by the pressure of about 20 metres of snow depth. But it takes a further 40 metres of snow to provide enough weight for the ice to start flowing and form into a glacier. It takes about three years for the heavy snowfall to have any effect on the flow of the glacier and the rate of flow varies a lot according to the climate. Like all rivers, the ice in the middle of the stream flows faster than at the edges. An aircraft which crashed here some three and a half kilometres from the terminal face of Fox Glacier took over six years to reach the bottom, indicating an average daily flow of one and a half metres a day. But the facts seem unimportant when viewing this marvel of nature's handiwork from such a vantage point as the helicopter. For the most part, we simply enjoy what many people have described as the most spectacular ride in the world. As we reach the lower end of this tongue of ice, another group of enthusiastic walkers string out across the Fox Glacier. Visitors from all parts of the globe probably enjoying that unique experience which we were asked to bring to the screen for Miss Karen Noon from Bondi Beach in New South Wales. Our bird's eye view has been an incredible experience. We can't help feeling a little jealous of the cheeky Kias, New Zealand's mountain parrots which live permanently in this frozen mountain world. They can enjoy a flight out over the glacier any time they want. Travel all over the countryside, ask the Leyland brothers. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be, ask the Leyland brothers. 